I was having dinner uh, the night that George W. Bush made his case to Congress for war with Iraq back after 9-11 and a few months that followed 9-11. I was actually in Washington, D.C. that evening for a, uh, a, a, I believe it was a training or some kind of business thing. And, and we were having dinner at a place called the Capitol Grill, which, by the way, <laughs> if you're ever in D.C. and you got too much money to spend, I could never go there on my own. It was a company thing. The Capitol Grill, that's probably the best steak I've ever had in my life outside of the ones that my son cooks on the grill. But at any rate, I was, I was there that night having dinner. And I remember they had a bar, like most restaurants do, they had a, par, a bar there. And if you remember the, the time frame and the sort of the, the feeling in America, I mean, we were, we were out for blood. And so people were packed up against the bar and watching the TV screen over the bar, and we could see the TVs from our table. And I remember that night looking out of uh, one of the windows in the, the restaurant, and I could see the dome of the Capitol building in that cent this very center of that window pane, like it was a picture on a wall. And it was such a surreal experience, such a, an odd experience to be there in that, that close to the Capitol building when all that was going on. But one of the things that I noticed as I looked out the, at, the, at the picture at, the, at the, the Capitol building was that you could see helicopters, Black Hawk helicopters, flying around the Capitol building. You could see their lights blinking, you know, the little lights that they have so you can see them. You could see them cut in front of the Capitol dome at times. Not really, really close, but clearly standing guard because you have the entire Congress, Senate, and the House. You have the President, the Vice President. You have the, you know, just have every, basically every federal government leader there is at that location. And I remember how, how cool that was to see that, that our boys were standing guard and you know, you're not going to get us tonight, is sort of what they were saying. But I remember as I walked out that night, out of the Capitol Grill, I, I could hear jet fighters in the air. And there's, there's always a distinct sound to a jet fighter. It's a much higher pitched, deeper roar than a commercial aircraft. So you can always tell when there's a fighter plane in the air. And I could hear them. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. And I, and I began to think about what was going on to protect that city at that moment that I could not see. And I imagine, you know, you have to imagine, I don't know this for a fact, but, but you have to imagine that there must be layers and layers of, of missile uh, systems going around Washington, D.C. There, there must have been that night plain-closed uh, officers out wandering the streets. There must have been checkpoints. There must have been military personnel. I mean, there must have been a serious system in place that night to protect the government of the United States uh, at that moment. It was a really, really neat uh, experience uh, for me. It was, it was something that I'll never... Uh, never forget. But you know, people, people, uh, responsible people protect the things that they love. They, uh, they put in systems and processes and men and, and things that keep the things that they love safe. That is what responsible people do for the things that, that they love. Now, Jesus Christ, uh, the Son of God, loves the church. He loves His kingdom. And He has designed it in a similar way. He has designed it to keep His enemies out of it and to keep His people secure inside of it. He has designed certain systems and processes and He has set certain people in place to protect His kingdom and to allow it to continue to move forward. This design includes the way the church is set up, its decision-making or power structure, what is known in theological terms as polity, P-O-L-I-T-Y, polity. But over the years, Baptists have slowly moved away from Christ's plan for the structure and decision-making process in His church. 
Little by little, we have moved away from this design that He has put in place to protect us. And our adjustments have given Satan free access to these processes, to the decision-making processes of our churches, and given him the ability to control the decisions of the churches in order to destroy them. It's as if we have changed the security system of the nation in order to not only make it possible for our enemies to get into the house, the Capitol building, and kill us, but we've put out signs and said, hey, come on in, nobody's watching. That is how bad we have uh, affected the uh, protection systems uh, that Christ has put in place in His church. And so tonight as we move into another session talking about how to revive Baptist churches, we are going to talk about these decision-making and power uh, systems and processes within the Church of Christ and see how those systems have been altered and those alterations have allowed Satan very easy access and a very easy ability to destroy us, to keep us from making decisions that move us forward, to always allow us to make decisions that ultimately destroy us. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about this in a couple of session, sessions. In today's session we're going to define polity. I want you to become familiar with this term. You know, uh, we don't use a lot of big terms in the churches these days, and, and sometimes that's a good thing. But we need to learn some of these terms, and the word polity is extremely important in the revival of the church. We're going to talk about de defined polity, and we're going to talk about its relationship to revival. Because the whole context of this series is to talk about how to revive Baptist churches. And then we're going to look at the two types of threats to the church. The whole context here is that Satan is entering the church through its power structure and he is destroying it. So we want to talk about the means by which Satan does that. Who are the vehicles? What types of people does he use to get in there and cause trouble through our existing power structure? And then we want to look at the current power structure or polity of Baptist churches. In general, how are Baptist churches set up and how do they make decisions? And then we want to talk about the Bible's structure. What does the Bible show us as Christ's way? of setting up the power structure and the decision-making processes within the church. And then in future sessions we'll talk about other things. We'll talk about the offices of elder and deacon, get into some detail about what their role is in this whole decision-making and power structure. And then we'll deep dive into congregational voting. We're going to look at congregational voting in a very uh, complete way. We're going to look at how it, become, how it became such so popular and how it is actually working against us in terms of protecting us. And then we'll look at the Bible's alternative to voting, and those will be in future sessions. I imagine we'll have at least two more sessions to do all of this. So let's begin here. Let's look, let's take a closer look at this word polity. What does polity mean? Polity is a word that essentially comes down to this. Let me distill it down to its simplest definition. Polity is all about who has the final say, the final authority, authority to say, this is what we are going to do. That is essentially what polity is. It is how an organization is set up to make decisions. Who, at the end of the day, gets to say, this is what we're going to do. And that, that central idea answers a number of questions. It deals with a number of issues for us. It says who makes the final decision and who does not make the final decision. That's one of the things that it will answer for you. It will give you the qualifications of the decision makers. Biblical polity, biblical power and decision making, and when you look into the Bible it's going to give you the qualifications of those who can make these decisions. And then it will talk about parameters and limits of the authority of those in the church. Christ gives certain principles by which the uh, decision makers must operate, and He limits the things that they can do in His Word. And then finally, it will tell you what is the role of those who do not have the final and direct authority over the decisions in the church. That is what polity is in a nutshell. Who gets to say, this is what we are going to do. Now there is a 
single goal of polity. As Christ has designed this decision making, this power structure, this polity, he has a central goal in mind, and that goal is that is that to ensure that the decisions made in the church are in accordance with God's will and will result in the prosperity of the people. That is the goal of polity. Uh, polity is not like we're thinking of politics in uh, the secular sense, where it seems that today polity is all about getting power so you can do whatever you want to do. Christ has not designed power in His church in order to accomplish the ends of those who are in power. Christ has designed polity in the church to make sure that the decisions that are made are the decisions that He approves of, that He wants made, so that the people will be favored and blessed as they go along. That is the goal of truly biblical polity, is to make sure that the decisions that we are making are lining up with those that Christ would have us to make. Uh, James mentioned it this morning, Paul said to follow me as I follow Christ. And so in a sense, polity is set up to make sure that the churches do that, that they follow Christ by following their leaders who are making these decisions. That's what polity is all about. That is the goal of biblical polity. Before we get into a whole lot more detail about this, let, let's look at the connection between polity and revival, between the uh, decision-making processes, the final authority process within the church, and what that has to do with reviving them and them coming back to life and being effective again. Let's look at that connection. Because you may be wondering, why, Wes, are we talking about polity when we're talking about revival? I can tell you this, when I first, uh, when I pastored my first church full-time, my mind was on revival. My mind was on taking that church and turning it around and seeing, new, seeing it grow, seeing a lot of new people added. So when I got there, I started working right away on evangelism and outreach. And in, I think it was eight months, 28 people joined the church. We had nine baptisms. People were being added. But what I didn't realize was, if you're not taking care of this power structure, the things that you try to do to grow the church will not last. So let's connect these two here. First of all, we, want, we know we want revival. That's where we're starting here on the left-hand side of the screen. We, we want to see the churches revived. We, we want to see people added. We want to see new ministries birthed. We want to see mercy work done to the poor. We want to see evangelism and outreach. We want to influence the culture. We want a vibrant, alive, powerful church. That's what we want. We want to revive. Well, I think it's obvious that if we're going to revive, we have to change. So revival, our, our desire and drive for revival is going to push us to make changes. We're going to have to look to change because clearly we are not uh, vibrant, full of ministries, and so on and so forth as Baptist churches overall in this nation. We are all really very near death, all of us. So what do we need to do there? We need to change in ways that increase the health of the church increase its spiritual health, increase its level of obedience. We need to make changes that move us towards greater health and obedience. Would you agree with that? All right. Well, we also then, we need to cut out, as Baptists, we need to cut out the fighting and the division that we have. If you've been in a Baptist church for very long, you know that Baptists fight all the time. Now, it's just the dirty laundry, and we're just going to talk about it. We're going to put it out right here and now. Uh, Baptists fight all the time. And one of the reasons that we're so small is because we split all the time. We split and we fight, and then good people leave when we fight. So if we're going to revive, not only do we have to move towards health and obedience, but we also have to stop all this fighting and division. You know, we cannot divide all the time and fight all the time and revive. Okay, you can't cut off your arm and increase your health. You know, you can't cut your foot off and increase your health. You have to stop the fighting and stop the division. But here's the problem with Baptist churches, and this is where polity comes in. 
The problem is, whenever we try to make these changes at the top, the health and obedience elements that we're trying to do, where we're trying to do more evangelism, do more mercy work, change the polity of the church, change the structure of the church, change things, deal with those who are being rebellious, uh, have discipline upon those members who are not uh, following Scripture. Wherever we try and do that, what always happens? We fight. That's where the fighting comes in. The fighting comes in when we try to make changes. There are some parts of the church that want to make a certain change. Some parts of the church want to make a different change. And another part of the church doesn't want to make any changes at all. So what ends up happening is through the power system within the church, which we're going to outline in a moment, the fighting takes place, the health and obedience is squashed, and the fighting and division occurs. And it's all through our existing polity. So this is where I was. You see, I really didn't think about the bottom fighting and division piece when I became a pastor, my first full-time pastor. I just thought about the top piece. So I started preaching the truth to the people. I started trying to move the people to do more outreach and make changes and uh, get, get a projector and a screen in there and just do things that were moving us forward. But what I didn't realize was all of that was going to be torn down by the polity in the church because I had not addressed that. So, in order for us to make the changes that produce the health, obedience, and, and eliminate the fighting, the first thing that we have to change is our polity. Our polity. The way that we are structured and the way we make decisions. And I'll give you some examples of that here in just a moment. But this is what we have to change. Otherwise, these uh, alterations that we seek to make will not be effective and they will not last. So polity and revival are very much connected. I can say this with great conviction. If your church stays organized, your Baptist church stays organized, like most Baptist churches are organized, and we're going to talk about what that is in just a moment, you will never see lasting revival because you are set up for Satan to come in and whenever he wants to and blow up what you're trying to do. Polity is absolutely essential. Now let's talk about who threatens the church. In the opening illustration, I talked about the defense systems around the capital of the United States and how they are looking out for their enemies. And I'm talking, I'm setting up polity as, as a means for Christ to protect the church and keep the enemies of the church from coming in, keeping those active agents of Satan from coming in and destroying the work that he is trying to do. So it would be helpful then to talk about who are these agents? And how do they infiltrate the church? And how do they use the power system to do that? Let's talk about it. There are essentially two types of agents Satan will use to destroy his church. The first is the false teacher. The first is the false teacher. Let's look at a ver verse here. 2 Peter 2.1 Peter warns the believers of the first century. But there were also false prophets among the people even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies and bring on themselves swift destruction. Now, you could spend a month talking about this verse, and you could apply this in about 50,000 ways in the United States right now with the number of false teachers that we have. But let me just make a couple of brief points about this and connect this to how these types of men and women will use the power structure of the church to destroy it. First of all, I want you to see that Paul, he is connecting here, Peter is connecting false prophets with false teachers. Prophets at, at the very core are teachers. And so he's saying a false prophet that we call, were called false prophets in the old days are now being referred to as false teachers. False teachers are false prophets. But he talks about their ways. He talks about them secretly bringing in destructive things secretly. This is the way people infiltrate the churches. This is the way the trouble begins. It is always in secret. And remember I told you that it begins deep within the heart, the most secret place of all, and then it becomes moving on to other people. It's secret. It's secret. What do they bring in? They bring in heresies. False teachers bring in heresies. Now, the root word here means the act of taking captive. 
A heresy is something that a teacher uses, a false teaching, something that is not true, in order to try and win disciples, win people over to his or her side in order to accomplish some goal. The act of taking captive. These false teachings are deceitful. They deceive people. And then they come and they join up and they fight the God-given authority structures in the churches. The goal is to take away a group of believers. And that's always the way it happens. In all the churches I've ever seen, this is always the way it happens. Somebody starts bringing in a false teaching. And this is a destructive teaching. This is a fascinating word here. These heresies, these teachings, remember teachings are nothing more than words and ideas. These words and ideas lead to destruction. And this word here means complete destruction, perishing or ruin. And so you, you have to, when somebody is beginning to, to try and win disciples over to their side, and we're going to look at what a false teacher really looks like, and it's not necessarily what you think. When somebody starts to teach something and try and win people over to their side in order to resist the powers that are in the church and the work of the church, this leads to des the destruction of the church. It leads, what is a split? What is a split? Is a split not destruction? <laughs> if you've ever been through a split, you know it is destructive. It destroys you. It destroys the other people. It's, it's a nightmare. It's destructive. And this is the word that's used about hell, destruction of hell. So it destroys the church and it can also destroy individuals by leading them to being condemned for their activities, their actions. And here's our mistake when it comes to false teachers. The mistake that we make is to think that a false teacher only looks like this. We think that a false teacher only looks like this. And I know many of you know who this is here. This is Joel Osteen, and Joel Osteen is a false teacher. He does not teach the truth. He is leading people to destruction. But our mistake is to believe that false teachers only look like this. They're out front, they're on TV, they're standing in the pulpits, they're, they're up front and for all to see. We think of the televangelist when we think of the false teacher, but that is not at all what most false teachers look like. Most false teachers look just like regular old Joes. In fact, most of the false teachers in Baptist churches today are not teachers at all. In other words, they're not preachers, they're not standing up in front of anyone. It's the little old lady in the nice white dress, the little old man in the overalls. These are the false teachers in most Baptist churches. You may remember when we talked last time, we talked about uh, a man named uh, Larry Hammett. Do you remember that? From Brunson and Kaner's book, Why Churches Die. You remember I read this, I believe I read this as the opening of the message the last time in Why Churches Die, they talked about a guy named Larry Hammett, who was, was the guy who was never happy with anything. He never had any vote that, he could, that he, he could support. And so he went to work when they were trying to get a building campaign going. He went to work to undermine what the pastor and the other leaders and the people wanted to do, and he was successful in that. But do you remember what it said about him? Let's look at this. Larry, this is Larry now. This isn't a preacher. This guy isn't up front. This guy's not on TV. Look at what he did. It says, First, Larry planted a measure of doubt in the minds of his Bible study class members. Larry felt he could sway them. He had done it before. He used his Bible study lesson to teach. To teach. That stewardship was a judicious protection of God's provision. Rushing into anything that would unwisely use the precious resources that God gave us, he taught, was an abuse of his loving provision. Most false teachers in Baptist churches are not preachers. They never end up in the pulpit. But there is always some element of their work that is teaching. And it doesn't, in Larry's case, Larry was using his Bible study to teach the people something that was not true, to pervert the truth in order to take power. Now, 
Larry too, like most false prophets and false teachers in the churches, was undoubtedly trying to use these arguments, these, these little teaching sessions with other people as he tried to grab power. He would grab them in the hallway of the church and try and explain to them what he was teaching in his Sunday school class. He would try and make his argument or he would call someone on the phone and try and make his argument. You see, he is teaching. He is using destructive ideas to bring down the church. You cannot think that false prophets and false teachers in Baptist churches are only those in the pulpits because they are not. Now, there's a second class of people and they're very much related. But there's a second class of people that threaten the church, and those are the dividers. Those are the dividers. Let's look at dividers. The Bible talks about dividers. Let's look at Ephesians 4.21. Paul says to reject, reject a divisive man, one who separates, one who pits people against each other, one against another. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. So there we have a divisive man. And then in Romans 16, Paul talks about it. He says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses and avoid them. So we see here in both cases, these men and potentially women are dividing. They are causing divisions. They are causing the separation between parties within the church. And in 2 Timothy 2, Paul instructs the elders on how they are to deal with these kind of people. He says, And a servant of the Lord must correct those who are in opposition, so that they may escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So what we have here is, we have, uh, generally this is going to be, Satan is going to use the false teacher. The false teacher is someone who, is, who, who, who can speak, who can make arguments, who is trying to get people together and, you, and use them against someone else. This is a charismatic talker, an uh, influencer, someone who can persuade people. And there's a subset of those people that are called divisive men. They're just divisive. They don't necessarily, they're not necessarily as charismatic and they can't necessarily talk as well as the false teacher. But they are nevertheless driving division. We talked about complainers a couple of sessions ago, one or two sessions ago. Complainers fall into this. They're always upset about something and they're always telling other people about them. And notice it says here that these people are taken captive by Satan to do his will. That means that people in the church can be taken captive by Satan. Now what kind of a person is taken captive by Satan? An immature believer. That's why I spent two sessions talking about the sins of seniors. Because these sins reflect a shallow faith. And a shallow person spiritually is going to be easily taken over by Satan. Easily used to accomplish his ends. They're taken captive. And this is, this is the divider right here. We talked about this the last time. This is the divider. The divider here is someone who's trying to use his influence to gain power. And see how it starts? Internal discontent, complaining, undermining, gathering support, public attack. These are dividers. So whether they can speak well or not, whether they have these, uh, these powerful personalities or not, they are false teachers and dividers, and Christ is trying to protect us from them in his, by setting the church up a certain way. Because what these folks ultimately do is manipulate the power system that we have created ourselves, that Christ didn't create, and use it to stop us from making those uh, decisions to move the church forward, stop us from making those decisions to change. That's how they do it. So let's look at current Baptist structure now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and lay out the Baptist structure that generally exists. This may be different in your church. It may be slightly different in, in all kinds of different Baptist churches. But from what I have seen, this is generally how it's done. And I want to point out the weaknesses, and then I want to show you 
what Christ's model is as we wrap up tonight. So let's look at current Baptist structure. Current Baptist structure begins with a single pastor. Most Baptist churches, the vast majority of Baptist churches, have a single pastor who is doing all the ministry, trying to make, uh, develop all the sermons, doing all the teaching, carrying the burden and weight of all the prayer. There's one pastor, and you notice that I have put him here at the bottom, and I'll tell you why here in a moment. There's a single pastor in most Baptist churches. And then over the pastor, we have the deacons. In most Baptist churches, in one way or another, formally or informally, openly or kind of quietly, the deacons are over the pastor. They're charged by the people to sort of keep an eye on the pastor. And if the people ever have any trouble with the pastor, they always go to the deacons and then the deacons go and talk to the pastor. So effectively, in most Baptist churches, the deacons are the managers or the bosses of the pastor. And then we have the members here at the top. The members are over the deacons and they sort of use the deacons to carry out whatever they want to carry out. The deacons become the servants of the members, but also in a power sense. The Bible, of course, talks about deacons as being the servants of the people, but they use the deacons as a, a, an element of their power. When they're trying to exercise their power, they will engage the deacons to do it. Now, here's the important part, and this is where the entrance of Satan comes in. The pastor has input in most Baptist churches, but he does not have the final say. So the man who's called of God, equipped of God, set in place by the Holy Spirit, does not have the final say on the decisions that the people make. The people have the final say. And this is not of Christ. This is actually completely upside down. Now we're going to look at the biblical structure here in a moment. But having the pastor, this is, this is roughly the equivalent. Let me tell you what this is equivalent to. If you had a family, and you had a family, and let's say they had 10 kids. If the 10 kids could sit down, let's say that, let's say that the, father, the father wanted to take a new job in another city, and he and his wife agreed that they should move. And so they sit down, and they, they talk to the children about it, and they say, okay, kids, you get to vote. Me and your mom are going to have one vote, and you guys are going to get to vote. And if you, if, you get, if you get the majority vote, we're not going to move. That's, the, that's essentially what is happening here. Now, I'm not trying to insult the members by saying they're children. You know, you're adults, okay? I've already pointed out that m many times, however, our, our Christian seniors and our other members act like children spiritually. But I'm not trying to insult you by calling you children. But spiritually speaking, in the church as a family, and we often call it a family, the pastor or pastors, which I'll show you in a moment, they are the fathers. They are supposed to be the ones in charge. And the children are, are the sheep. The sheep are to listen to the shepherd. The sheep are to follow the shepherd. And the shepherd, the pastor, the father, if you will, not in a Catholic sense, but just in a, in a, in a comparison as an illustration, the people are to listen to the spiritual father or the pastor. And he is to have the authority. And surrounding all of this and the way all of this say is occurring is through the instrument of voting. Voting is the way that the members express their will and make the final decision. This is what happens in a typical Baptist church. Now let me show you how Satan uses this. All right, let me show you how he uses it. I have seen it myself. I have experienced it myself uh, a number of times. All right, let's take, we're going to take two scenarios. Let's say that a church is without a pastor. And the church is set up, as I have suggested already, in this typical Baptist structure. The church was looking for a new pastor. The church brings this guy in, and they call him to be the pastor. And they tell him they want to grow, they want to move forward, they want to impact the community, you know, all the things that all the committees always say. So the preacher comes in, and the preacher starts preaching the Word. 
The preacher starts calling out the sins of the people. The preacher starts talking about things that people don't want him to talk about. He starts meddling and uh, trying to make changes, suggesting changes, moving forward with what he believed the people wanted him to do, what the Bible tells him to do. But remember, I told you that a great deal of the, the seniors in churches are very spiritually immature. So when the preacher starts preaching about things they don't like, when he starts talking about sin and true obedience and all of the different things that the Bible talks about, the people reject that quickly. It, very soon they don't like this. So most of the time what they'll do is they will talk to the deacons and have the deacons talk to the pastor. But at the end of the day, what they will do is they will reject this teaching and this leadership of the pastor through the deacons first, they will use the deacons to carry out this subterfuge and tell the preacher that they don't like what he's doing. But at the end of the day, they will control the pastor through the voting process. They will use the voting process to vote down what the pastor thinks the church needs to do. They will use the voting process to cancel out any funding for what the things that the pastor wants to do. And eventually, if the pastor doesn't get in line, they will use the voting process to remove the pastor. Happens every week. So you can see how this system of having the spiritual father, if you will, at the bottom, and then the deacons and then the, the sheep at the top, and then voting as the real instrument of exercising power and making a decision, is completely working against the the preaching of the word and the changes. You see how the revival is, is stunted and, and really killed here? And one of the things that I've noticed about this, there, there are churches, Baptist churches, that have gone through pastor after pastor, year after year. They'll bring one in, he'll last a couple of years, and they'll bring another one in, and they'll bring another one in, and they'll bring another one in, and one by one, whether it's three years or five years or two years or one year, they, they'll end up He'll be gone. He'll be gone. And here's what happens. The children, the spiritual children, the members, they, they are very childish and they do not want the discipline of their spiritual father. They don't want the word to come in and uh, conflict with what they like about their church. They want it to stay the way it is. They want it to keep it a social club. They want it to be whatever it is they want it to be. And they don't want this guy to come in and mess it up. They want him to come in and be a chaplain, to marry them and bury them, and that's all they want. So what happens is when God sends a man in there, and that man is focused on the Word, and that man is teaching the Word, and that man is not taking some of the baloney that the people try and throw at him, because of the power system, the children throw a little fit. They throw a little fit. We don't like this. We don't like this. And then they vote him out the door. And God sends another man in there to do it. And they vote him out the door. So what happens is the children are never challenged to grow up in the Lord. They stay children year after year. And this is a perpetual spiritual childhood. And so you end up with churches full of older people who spiritually are children because the system that's in place to make decisions allows them to kick the pastor, the spiritual father, out on his ear when he is not doing what they want him to do. That is why you end up with so many childish seniors because the pastors aren't allowed the ability to change them, to discipline them, teach them, instruct them because they're pushed out the door through the power system. Let's say that a proposal is made for change. We talked about a building campaign. I mentioned to you I'm not crazy about building campaigns that require debt. Well, let's say that the church wanted to, uh, to build something. They wanted to build an extra addition onto the youth building, let's say. Now, let's say the church had the money. Let's say the church has got money in the bank and they could pay for it right out of their, right out of their checkbook if they wanted to. So the pastor's on board. The forward-thinking members are on board. And what happens? Ah, oh, oh no, 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 no. The people don't like this. There's a group of people in there who don't want to see the change, don't want to spend the money, more concerned about the money than they are the spiritual growth and uh, expansion of the church. And so what happens? Well, they start talking amongst themselves. They start gathering groups together. And then they go to this vote. And they overrule the pastor and the team and the word itself. 
And they do that by the vote, the business meeting and the vote. So you see the common element here is that the polity through the instrument of voting is what shows up in both of these. That's the, the final say is the vote. And that comes down to the sheep. And what you see here in both of these cases is that polity actually prevents obedience. It keeps the people from obeying. And I've seen it time and time again. And this is how Satan does. All he has to do is get one or two or three of the older, immature members to start working on the other older, immature, immature members. And the next thing you know, the vote is down, the pastor's discouraged, the people who tried to make the change leave. Eventually the pastor either quits out of frustration or they ask him to leave. And then we have what we have in Baptist churches today. But Christ's design is different. Christ's design is completely different. Let me show you His. I'm not going to show you verses tonight. I'm going to show you verses the next session. Now I just want to show you the design as compared to what we're, all, what we're doing primarily now. The structure of the church as Christ had designed, it begins with multiple pastors. Multiple pastors. And you notice I put them at the top here. Not just one guy having to do all the work, do all the prayer, do all the preaching, the teaching, deal with all the issues and the funerals. No, no, no. There are multiple men in God's Christ design who are sharing this ministry, sharing the leadership decision, sharing the prayer, sharing the teaching, and I'll go over that more later. But there are multiple of these. And under these biblically qualified men are deacons. These deacons do not have authority over the pastors in Christ's design. They are under the pastors. They work for the pastors. Their job is to take the physical, temporal, time-bound work off of the pastors so that those pastors can focus on the prayer and the ministry of the Word as we see in Acts chapter 6. And I'll talk more about verses later, but this is just, I'm giving you a, a big snapshot here. All right? And then under those are the members. Now I'm not suggesting here that the deacons are over the members in authority, but this is just the way I needed to show it to, to make the distinction. The deacons are working and helping the, the people. They're interfacing between the pastors and the people about issues and concerns and all of that thing. And then the members are at the bottom submitting to the authority of the pastors and the work of the deacons. And in Christ's design, the members have input but they do not have the final say. The final say is always with the pastors or elders on any significant thing that the church has to decide on. The elders are to have the final say. And this whole thing of voting is virtually eliminated. There can be no biblical structure where the members can turn against the pastors and overrule their authority. Now you might say right away, you say, well, what about if the pastors are trying to do something wrong? Well, we're going to go over this in our next session, but God has placed requirements along the way to ensure that this doesn't happen. But it can happen. Any bad thing can happen in any design that you have people in. But if we use Christ's design, we have the best chance of success and He will be blessing us because we are honoring Him in it. Now let me show you how this is different on the two situations that we gave before. Let's say Christ sends a pastor to a church. All right? And that pastor sets up multiple pastors that are qualified. Very key word later down the road. But this man starts to preach and teach the word and lead the people. And those people, they don't like to hear it but they cannot reject the pastor through the deacons. They cannot turn against the spiritual head of that local congregation by engaging the deacons to go tell the preacher that he needs to stop with that hellfire and brimstone and start preaching some stuff that we want to hear. They can't do that, you see, because they don't have the instrument to do it. And they cannot use voting to control the pastor. Baptists are famous for doing things like votes of confidence. I, They'll actually have a vote of confidence on the pastor. This is one of the instruments they use in the voting process to get rid of a guy. And I'm just wondering where the vote of confidence is in the Scriptures. 
So they'll use the voting. But see, if there is no voting, if there is no mechanism for the people to overcome the pastor, then they cannot do that. They have to submit to what he's telling them from the word. They have to listen to him tell them about their sins and they have to wrestle with what he's saying from the word. Now they may leave and that's fine, but it, they can't just throw him out and continue on their childish ways because they don't like what he's saying. And that is what happens so much of the time. If a proposal is made for change and the pastors are in full agreement and the, the teams that are involved are in full agreement and some of the other people are involved are in full agreement, the people cannot overrule the pastors and the teams and the word. They don't have a mechanism to do that. The business meeting vote cannot be used as a tool to stop the uh, important changes that the, the, the church needs to make. Remember Larry Hammett. Remember what he did there. Remember? This is very, very important as we finish this session is that when you do the power structure the way Christ has set it up, when you have the process of decision making the way he has set it up, with the pastors having the final say, and no, no voting on these issues that can overwhelm the pastors and put their counsel out beside the house, if you will, then the troublemaker loses the most important piece of his arsenal, and that is the business meeting voting process. With a biblical structure, Larry Hammett would be denied the platform of the business meeting vote to carry out his satanic plans and could be disciplined for his divisive actions. You see, a biblical power structure moves the authority into those men that Christ himself has set in place, that he is qualified, that he is trained, that he is controlling. And then the people like Larry and other immature believers who are trying at every turn to blow the thing up they don't have a way to do it. Now you, again, I will talk about how pastors are kept from becoming tyrants in our next session. You think about this for a moment, the fact that there are multiple ones of them, that they must be biblically qualified, that they themselves have been taught in the Word, how are they, they are to exercise their authority and all of these things. Are going to, you're going to see that if you do this the way Christ said it, from top to bottom, left to right, you're going to find that this system can make revival possible. And we've already mentioned that pastors have the power to lead the people in Christ's design. And in this case, the polity of the church enables its obedience and does not keep it from being obedient.